Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. In the illustrious history of the New York Yankees, one pitcher stands above all the others, Edward Charles Ford, Whitey. Whitey began on the sandlots of Astoria. He won more games than anyone who wore the Yankee pinstripes, and he wound up in the Hall of Fame. Today, we salute the immortal Whitey Ford. Marty Appel, good to see you again. Um, nobody knows more about Yankee history than Marty Appel. And if you want to be as smart as he is about Yankee history, just uh, get his book, Pinstripe Empire. You read this, you're as smart as Marty, and then I'll have you on the show. Anyway, Marty, we're here to talk about Whitey Ford. He was the greatest Yankee pitcher, true, false. Nobody really disputes that. I mean, if you wanted a guy for one inning, you might turn to Mariano Rivera. But Whitey Ford was the winningest pitcher in Yankee history, uh, a World Series hero who won more World Series games than anybody, who pitched 33 and th two-thirds consecutive scoreless innings in the World Series. Uh, he was the one you wanted to hand the ball to if you needed a victory. I should mention Marty's coming to us at least virtually, from Miller Huggins Field. Tell the folks about Miller Huggins Field. The photo behind me, which I took myself about 12 years ago, uh, is of the outfield at Miller Huggins Field in St. Petersburg, Florida, which is now known as Huggins Stengel Field. And uh, it's where the Yankees began spring training in 1925 with Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig on the team. And they continued there until uh, 1961 before they moved to Fort Lauderdale. Mm, okay. So uh, it's got a lot of history behind it. You talked about Whitey's record World Series. He seemed to shine the brightest uh, under the brightest lights of the World Series. He had the characteristic that we New Yorkers pride ourselves on. He was unflappable in a big situation. He could rise to the occasion. He could handle the pressure. Uh, born and bred in New York City, that's the style that we like, and he exhibited it. Whitey uh, was what the sports writers like to call uh, a crafty lefty. I mean, I, it's a cliche that has come to mean, I don't know, almost whatever you want it to mean. But by and large, this guy was not an imposing figure on the mound, at least in stature. Could he make the team today? Well, he could make the team today if given a chance to show what he could do. The better question is, would anybody sign him today? And I think that answer would be no. He was a five foot nine, five foot ten inch first baseman when Paul Critchell discovered him playing for the 34th Avenue Boys in Astoria. Yeah. And Critchell saw some, Critchell was the scout who had signed Lou Gehrig. And he saw something in Whitey Ford that made him think Whitey could be a pitcher. So he became a successful pitcher. Interesting, um, since World War II, there have only been two pitchers who've gone into the Hall of Fame under six feet tall Whitey Ford and Pedro Martinez. Mm. <laughs> so stature counts for a lot in pitching and of course today everybody's looking for pitchers who can throw 95 to 100 miles an hour which Whitey couldn't do yeah I know I don't want to get into how the game has changed and and why everybody looks for pitchers that can throw 95 100 but it isn't pitching necessarily to be able to blow people away at 95 and 100 its location and, and, its, and its deception in terms of change of speed. And Whitey had all of that. He was, as they always said, the crafty little left-hander. Um, he didn't, I mean, the term didn't originate for him because his predecessor as a, as a left-hander on the Yankee starting rotation was Eddie Lopad, who also had blonde hair. Whitey got his nickname from his minor league manager, Lefty Gomez, mm. 
who called him Whitey. And uh, Lefty Gomez was the first of those great left-handers that the Yankees employed. Interesting that he called him uh, Whitey. I mean, his hair was blonde, but you know, I guess you could understand where it came from. We've been talking about how Whitey is a New Yorker. Whitey was a New Yorker. He comes out of Astoria. And I think one of the reasons Yankee fans and maybe baseball fans in general liked this guy was that, uh, especially from New York fans, because he was a New Yorker and he sounded like a New Yorker. And that voice, I mean, you have to, you just have to adore the sound of Whitey Ford talking about anything. And I thought in this program, we'd give our audience a chance to hear Whitey. Um, this is uh, Whitey talking to the MLB network uh, about pitching that title game for the Queens Sandlot team that you mentioned, uh, Marty, the uh, 34th Avenue boys, they won the Sandlot championship. Uh, and I think he was 17 at the time. And out of that came the signing for the Yankees. Let's listen to Whitey. And our team ended up winning the New York City Sandlot Championship in a game at the Polo Grounds. I had pitched 11 innings and I pitched pretty good. It was about three or four teams wanted to sign me. The Yankees offered me $7,000, which I thought was, you know, more money than, than it was in the whole world. And I, I, I would have signed with them anyhow because uh, it was always my team. They was always my team. Doesn't get much better than that, does it? When uh, there was a time when I was the executive producer of the Yankee telecasts on WPIX, Whitey was a broadcaster off and on for us. And he used to, oh, it would grate on me. He, he would say, he'd done well his last time out. Mm. And the producer in me wanted to take him aside and say, that's not how you say it. But I couldn't do it because it was natural. And I think the fans were fine with it. So Whitey always said he'd done well his last time out. Yeah. Uh, you've got a lot of personal history with, with Whitey. I mean, anecdotes you've told me over the years. Uh, there's one uh, just about his New York attitude and how you uh, uh, encountered it. I think what? You were writing a bio of him or something? Um, from time to time, whether it was for a magazine or a newspaper column or something, I'd have to write little bios of, of Whitey. And he was very good at correcting me because I'd always let him proofread it. Really? I had the 34th Street Boys. He made sure I knew it was Avenue. Um, he went to um, Aviation Tech High School in Manhattan because his local team, high school in Astoria didn't have a baseball team. So he could care less about aviation, but he wanted to play for that team, and he did. And um, when I was including that in the story, he said, make sure you mention I had a perfect attendance record. So he, just well, as he won a Cy Young Award, he wanted that in there too. <laughs> Cy Young Award winner, Hall of Famer, and perfect attendance record in high school. Right. <laughs> um, I love there's a story you have. You were walking along Fifth Avenue with him one day going somewhere to tell, tell the folks that story. Okay, so we had an event at uh, Bryant Park and then we were going to lunch at Rockefeller Center. So we walked up Fifth Avenue like six or seven blocks and it occurs to me as we're walking that not one person has shown any recognition for the great Whitey Ford, which mm. surprised me a lot. Yeah. So I said to him, nobody's recognized you. Isn't that surprising? And he said, it's because I'm walking with you. If I was walking with Mickey Mantle, everybody would recognize me. <laughs> <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> it's like Joe Torre, who, what, one, what happened? He, he grounded into four double plays in a game. He went on for four, and he blamed it on the guy in front of him who walked. He said, you didn't get on base. I <laughs> yeah. For those of us who've worked in baseball for many years, as I have, it's all about the stories. It's not about the statistics. It sure is. Uh, uh, you know, I've, I haven't worked in baseball, but I've hung around those after game um, uh, in the days when there were press rooms with a bar. Uh, 
the announcers and some of the coaches would love to come in those rooms and, and swap stories. And I would hang to the side and just listen to Ralph Kiner, for instance. There, you know, there was nobody who could tell stories better than Ralph Kiner. Um, you know, late in his career, 66 or seven, and Whitey had injuries and he was battling, you know, arm trouble of various kinds. And But he pitches a, uh, a great game against the White Sox. And you have a story about talking to him about that later on and I, I really enjoyed this story. Um, I was still in college, but I was such a fan that I would sometimes go to my car and sit in the car for two hours, two and a half hours, listening to the whole broadcast because I couldn't get it in my dorm room. And this one particular day in 1967, Whitey shut out the White Sox. Now this was near the end of his career, everybody knew it. And in fact, he retired just a few weeks later, but here he is pitching a complete game shutout against the White Sox. It so made, gave me such joy. I was so happy at that. So a couple of years later, when we'd become friends, um, I told him that whole story as I just told it to you. And he laughed and he said, I don't think any of those pitchers were, pitches were legal that day. <laughs> <laughs> as though he was acknowledging the occasional accusation that he doctored the ball. <laughs> yeah, I, it was probably more than occasional, and it certainly was behind the scenes rumor about him. Uh, and he had, and and then in his bio or his memoir years later, he actually revealed his tricks, didn't he? He did. First, the nation was outraged when Jim Bouton wrote about it in Ball Four and everybody yeah. was quick to deny it. And then Whitey did an autobiography called Slick, which was a nickname he had uh, with Phil Pepe. And he said it right in the, uh, in the autobiography that uh, he learned various tricks about doctoring the, the seams of the baseball with his wedding ring and stuff like that. So, uh, you know what, when it came to Whitey Ford, everyone was forgiving. Uh, even the umpire sort of winked at the trickery that he might have engaged in as he approached the 17th year of his career. So uh, it was all well and good because it was Whitey Ford. You know, about the umpires uh, forgiving him or, or not calling him on it, there's a there's a an anecdote. I don't, you know, I'm it's hearsay. And uh, but the anecdote is that uh, late in the career, uh, one of the umpires in the game he was pitching saw what was going on, came out to Whitey on the mound and said, um, here's what needs to happen, Whitey. You need to call timeout, go in the locker room uh, change, to change your jock. And when you come back out, don't have the ring on your finger. <laughs> it's a wonderful story and maybe it's apocryphal, but it is kind of speaks to how the how the umpires uh, uh, respected him. It's true. And umpires are human. They have their favorites as they go along. And uh, this is a, a little off to the side anecdote, but there was an umpire in the American League named Nestor Shylock. Mm -hmm. I remember the name. Yeah. And uh, we used to go on a promotional caravan every winter out to the hinterlands to drum up some publicity. So we went to Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania this one year and Nestor Shylock, who lived near there, came to the caravan. It was a free lunch and a chance to say hello to everybody. And then they asked him to say a few words and he got up and he said, well, you know, we're supposed to be neutral, but I got to let you know I'm a Yankee fan through and through. <laughs> and it was like, what a shock to hear an umpire say that. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. Well, today he'd be... Today he'd be bombarded for, for something like that. Yeah. Anyway, Whitey with the tricks and admitting them and just the way he carried himself. What a personality, a larger than life personality for kind of a, you know, he wasn't that large in life, 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, uh, big and brash and, and a star in his 17 years with the Yankees and enough of a star to be cast in a very clever, very unusual television commercial. Look at this. Now tell me the truth. 
Don't you think a knuckleball is much harder to throw than a screwball? Oh, no, 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 Whitey. Whitey Ford and his new friend Salvador Dali always fly Braniff. They like our food, they like our style, and they like to be on time. Thanks for flying Braniff, fellas. When you got it, flung it. Tell him, Dolly baby. Tell him, Dolly baby. I would love to have been able to talk to Whitey right after that and say, you know, you were not phased at all being in the presence of Salvador Dali. And and Mr. Dolly didn't seem to be phased at all to being in the presence of Whitey. But what a fabulous ad that is. Didn't help Braniff much, did it? <laughs> no, it didn't. It didn't. Um, but it's just gorgeous. I mean, it, it put it, to me anyway. Portray, it portrays you know just the, the brash Whitey Ford, and uh, that that by the way is a work of the renowned art director and the ad man um, George Lois, who is a genius. And uh, he did another one of those for Braniff with Sonny Liston and Andy, Andy Warhol. There was another commercial Whitey he did. Uh, the product was Puss in Boots cat food. Mm. And it featured Yogi talking to a cat. And Whitey did the cat's voice, but was never shown on camera or even identified. But by then his voice was so well known that everybody got the joke when the commercial ran. Yeah, great. Whitey see, uh, liked the nightlife um, with Mickey and Billy. They'd go out and, you know, have a few cocktails. Uh, and uh, I think was known as a guy who, um, you know, he, he didn't abuse it. He didn't get in trouble uh, that we know of and, uh, and, and was always ready to pitch. But this was a guy who liked the nightlife and liked to sleep late. And it, 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 came, it, it gave him a problem, at, at least at the times when he roomed with Yogi. Um, it's true. And uh, they were kind of the odd couple rooming together. Uh, when you say Whitey liked the nightlife, he sort of grew up in it. His father owned a saloon in Astoria. And Whitey would go there after school, not to drink, but to just be part of the atmosphere there. So he was very comfortable with the nightlife. He knew the New York City nightclub scene. When they all went out in 1957 and a notorious evening uh, that ended at the Copacabana with some fists flying and some bodies on the ground, it was surely Whitey who would have said, hey, let's go to the Copa. Uh, I know the guys at the Copa will get a good table. So yeah. he was the leader in that sense. And as you say, a kind of odd pairing of, of roommates, him, Whitey, and Yogi. Yeah. Yogi's a guy who got up, you know, at the crack of dawn. And, and Whitey uh, talked about this. Uh, he, he and Yogi were being interviewed at one time by Tim Russert on CNBC. And uh, he talked about uh, <laughs> their different lifestyles. Uh, as he as he was uh, explaining their life on the road to Tim Russert. Watch this. He gets up at 6.30 in the morning. I said, wake me up for breakfast. He never came back to the room. Red Patterson woke me up at noon for a 1 o'clock game. Oh I was God. pitching. I got there about, got to the park at 20 to 1, and guys like Bauer and Hauk are looking at me. I'm a rookie with the club one month. They said, don't fool with our money, kid. <laughs> You know, don't fool with our money, kid. I mean, you know, this was a time when not baseball players weren't making the money they're making now, and the Yankees were uh, used to being in the in the postseason, the playoffs, whatever you want to call it. And you know, and uh, you call it the World Series and the World Series, and they wanted that money. I mean, they wanted the title, they wanted the ring, but you know, farther they went, there was more money. So this kid. <laughs> They were wondering whether this kid was going to upset the apple cart, I guess. Well, when they would negotiate with George Weiss, the general manager, and they had, noth they had nothing to stand on, there was no union. Um, but Weiss would always tell them, oh, don't worry about it. You'll pick, a, pick up the difference in your World Series share. So that's the way they played the game. That was what they were looking forward to. Yeah. Uh, he handled it well, it seems, at least from the way he tells it, you know, he just showed up and he pitched a great game. He won that game. Um, and he was only 21 years old then. 
but he had, you know, the expression ice water in his veins. He was a very cool customer out there. Yeah, I guess at the end of that game, if they had any doubts that this kid was going to fool with their with their paychecks, their money, uh, he uh, he washed those away. Uh, there's an you were telling me, or I think you have a photo of um, uh, Katie Couric uh, and her was so excited that 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 Whitey was in the building. Talk, talk you know, when he was when he, when they were doing this interview with. Tim Russert. Talk right. About it. it was it was at 30 Rock and it was when they were doing the Tim Russert interview and somebody called Katie in her office upstairs to say Whitey Ford and Yogi Berra are here. Well, Whitey was Katie's favorite player and I think she said her father's favorite player too. So in lightning speed, she bolted down to the studio, got there before the taping began and was gushing like a little schoolgirl baseball fan, talking to Whitey about how much she loved him and getting his autograph for her father. It was a beautiful moment. <laughs> mm. That's uh, yeah, and a uh, nice moment for you to to share with with uh, Whitey and Yogi. They they were they were a pair uh, on that interview. If you folks want to look it up on YouTube with uh, Tim Russ or Yogi or something, you'll find it. And it's 45 minutes of pure joy. Um, and, and we're happy they're letting us borrow some of the, some of the sound from that. Uh, and we have one, one more of Whitey. And, and this goes to um, uh, the efforts, or at least relates to the efforts Major League Baseball has for years now been trying to shorten games and they everything they try they it doesn't work and of course they haven't tried the basic thing which is you know fewer commercials but they're not going to do that not going to happen uh, and um uh you know but they've been on this kick about they got to make games shorter and it just doesn't work and i was thinking after watching whitey in this interview with tim russell on cnbc I was thinking that maybe they ought to, MLB, uh, the commissioner ought to find a way to clone maybe 25 or 30 Whitey Fords. And the reason is that he liked to work fast and listen to what he tells uh, Tim Russert in, in, in this clip. And I love to pitch fast games like the whole, yeah. Yogi and Tony Kubek used to always say they'd love to play behind me yeah. because it was, it's no fast. rubbing your ball up in 20 seconds between pitches, one pitch after another. And two hour game. If it was more than two hours, I didn't like it. More than two hours, I didn't like it. <laughs> I'll tell you how they could save two hours now if they banned Velcro. <laughs> the players adjusting their gloves at each each pitch would yeah. save two hours if you banned that. Well, you know, I, I don't want to get off the subject of Whitey, but uh, and 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 talk about particular peeves. But that's one is you know the, the rules are, and they supposedly enforcing them. The batter's supposed to stay in the batter's box. Well, they never enforce that rule. They always step out after every pitch. And you're right, the Velcro. They do this, and then they do that, and then they. You know. And as long as we're on, on this particular rant, let me just say. Um, you know, it really bothers me that television networks that broadcast ESPN, Fox, uh, you know, and especially this time they, at the time of year of the playoffs, um, and and television determines the time of those games, and so we have lots of games where the shadows are on the field interrupting uh, play in the sense that it's very difficult for a batter to see the pitch coming through the shadows. And we hear the announcers talking about it incessantly. It's, it really affects the game. It's going to be another half. And I never heard one of them say, you know, it's our fault. We told them to start the game at this time. Well, that's that as a former producer of television. Um, I used to think they could do a little something, at least in Yankee Stadium, because the shadows in Yankee Stadium capture flagpoles with flags flopping in the breeze, which adds to the uh, distraction if you're a batter. Sure. Uh, they don't have to fly those flags. At least the poles could be stationary. 
but I can't, I, I don't want to reinvent the game here. <laughs> uh, I think you should. Um, I want to talk finally about a moment late in Whitey's life uh, at an at an old timers day. Uh, Yankees, uh, I, I salute the Yankees. They continue to to uh, have the old timers day celebration. The Mets don't, and they ought to bring that back. But talk about that day, that particular day with Whitey. Well, the last few years that Whitey attended Old Timers Day, he was already showing traces of Alzheimer's disease, which in fact he had for at least six or seven years of, towards the end of his life. And especially the last couple, which would be 2019 and 18, you could the camera would go to him. He was the last guy introduced. The camera would pick him up in the dugout and you could see he was disoriented. He didn't really quite get what was going on. And somebody would push him up the dugout steps to the field. He was still confused. It was sort of painful to see. But suddenly he saw the majesty of Yankee Stadium in front of him and he heard the roar of the crowd. And that was familiar to him. He was now in a familiar place and I think at that moment, he was once again, his nickname, the chairman of the board. It all kind of came together. And I think those were beautiful moments. That's a beautiful story, Marty. And uh, enjoy your bringing us into Whitey Ford's life, professional and personal. Thanks very much for this. Good to My see pleasure. you. My pleasure, always a pleasure talking to you, Tony. <laughs> <laughs>